Right then, good morning everyone or good afternoon or good evening depending where you are joining us from around the world. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. Welcome to West and Astara's uh, Marine Cyber Risk Update. My name is Simon Hodgkinson and I'm the Global Head of Loss Prevention for West and I'm joined today by some real experts in this field. Chris South is a senior underwriter for the West. Bill Edgerton is the chief cyber officer at Astara and Howard Potter is the head of cyber marine underwriting at Astara. We will take a bit of housekeeping. We will take questions at the end. There is a questions tab at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions, type them in there and we will try to get to as many of them as we can at the time after the slides. So why are we here? On the 1st of January 2021, we'll bring a significant change to the shipping industry as we enter into the cyber age with a bump. The reason for this is that when you complete your next annual verification of the DOC, you will need to show how you have integrated cybersecurity into your SMS. And for example, the US Coast Guard have already stated that they are looking closely at the implementation on board vessels entering the US. I know a lot of you are wondering or asking, why do you need to worry about cyber risk? You're not an interesting target to the cyber criminals and banks and business, big business are where they're going to be looking. So let me try to give you an example to where there might be some effects. We all buy bunkers for ships. You might spend 100,000 US dollars or maybe up to a million dollars if you're taking a big load on a cheap port. And you buy them through different suppliers and you buy use different brokers. If you were a hacker looking for an easy target, where would you go? The international bank with all the security or a smaller shipping company? Now your office has good IT security probably, but however, you're now connected to your ships. The crews have had an incredibly tough year and a lot of us have been improving the connectivity on the vessels to allow them to communicate with home. Absolutely essential in this era of COVID and delayed crew changes and the challenges that people are having on board. So we look at the vessels. The enthusiasm we had to integrate and link all of the equipment together to talk to each other now means your network on board is only as protected as the weakest link in the chain. You then have the service engineer who asks to put his USB stick into a computer to print the service report or to transfer an updated manual. How many different vessel computers has this USB stick been connected to before it ended up on your vessel? Then there's the mate who borrowed the USB stick from the Ectis to transfer some music from the service engineer's computer. Or the master who can't remember passwords so he keeps them taped under his keyboard crew using their own devices on board, which aren't subject to the company IT policy. Crews are inventive. If you leave them to their own devices, they will find a way to connect to the fastest connection on board to get to home. Without This is not necessarily how the IT department intended their access to the systems to be. This all could give an ac a hacker access to learn about how the company operates and concentrate a spear phishing attack on the procurement department and the right person within the department who deals with the bunkers. The hacker then theoretically could take control of the procurement PC and issues his own invoice for fuel, replacing the real one. And you've generously then sent a lot of money to that person. I come from an operations management background and I have seen all of these incidents individually in my time there. So it's time to let the experts give us some real information and more depth and education in this area. So first off, we have Bill Edgerton, who is the Chief Cyber Officer at Astara and an expert in cyber risk, having both worked for the British government and more recently within the private sector. Bill, welcome. Thank you very much, Simon, and uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, I'd like to special thanks to the West for hosting us on this platform. It's a terrific uh, idea, and also for you for attending these meetings. 
Um, I'd like to talk first off about the, um, the IMO's regulations. Um, in July, June 17, they passed a ruling which basically said that the account, uh, cyber risk management needed to be taken account of in the SMS um, of each vessel. Now, what was clever about this resolution was that although the uh, recommendation itself were recommendatory and not mandatory, the SMS itself is mandatory. So basically, they left the nation states to do the work, the dirty work for them and make all of this compulsory. So now we have a situation where administrations have taken steps to make cyber risk appropriately addressed in SMS systems and uh, the regulations come in force from the 1st of January. And I think we need to be very aware of that date because although it says that these should take place on anniversaries of the renewal of company documents of compliance, Coast Guard and um, both the US and UK are taking this to mean that as of the 1st of January, cyber security needs to be incorporated in vessel SMSs. So this is the first sort of key alert that we need to bear in mind. The second issue is one of timing and why uh, I think this has taken become so serious. This meeting of the Maritime Safety Committee of the IMO concluded on the 16th of June 2017. And if we look at the next slide, we can see how uh, the, uh, the Facilitation Committee basically issued their guidance note on the 5th of July 2017. And we need to remember what happened between those two dates, and I'm sure you'll all remember. Uh, AP Muller got hit um, on the uh, 27th of June, which falls nicely between these two events, and therefore gave the facilitation committee, I suspect, a real jolt in making sure that what they said was actually more germane and more punchy than perhaps might otherwise have been the case. But they were into take into account the future direction of shipping in terms of digitization, integration and automation, and uh, ultimately looking towards uh, autonomy for the shipping fleets. And they give some high level explanations of what risk management actually means. Um, and this is incumbent on all um, ship owners and, and ships companies to make sure that the risks to their systems from both a safety and an environmental perspective are uh, covered off, identified, analyzed, assessed, and that there is a process and series of processes in, places, in place to make sure that these risks are treated, mitigated, or perhaps transferred off to an insurer such as ourselves. So clearly, uh, there, is a, there was a momentum built up over that period of 17. And a lot of other big hacks happened in 2017 as well. So everybody was very sensitized to this issue. But what is most uh, striking is that after the IMO took the resolution, AP Muller got hit. And you'll recall that IMO got hit recently as well in its headquarters. So um, IMO is in the thick of things at the moment. So if we look at the next slide, um, to recap. so. This is focused on safety systems and systems that work for environmental protection on board vessels. Uh, it does not deal with security, which is subject to another code, the ISPS code, but there is an overlap. And clearly ship owners need to be aware of the overlap and make sure that they recognize the overlap whilst trying to limit duplication. There are clearly statements made by the, the IMO about things that need to be done. And there are a number of guidance documents that have been issued by various groups, whether it's the uh, classification societies that Chris will talk later about in the UK, the Department for Transport with the Institute of Electronic and Technology, as well as um, the D Defence Science and Technology Laboratories issued some codes of practice, which uh, ship owners are encouraged to uh, follow. But um, critically, risks need to be identified, assessed and managed. Roles and responsibilities are very important. Um, whether or not they're stated in the, in the guidance, which they are, but clearly there needs to be somebody responsible for this stuff if things happen. And whether it's the master or somebody working directly for the master in the period of absolute responsibility who understands this issue, there needs to be clear, clearly identified so that they know where their role is and that everybody else knows who's responsible for what. It's very important, and I'm sure the, the inspectors will be looking for a credible instant response plan. Um, it's all very easy to have a plan that doesn't work. The tricky bit is to make it work and to ensure that the, your people are trained on it and that if systems are knocked out fully, you have a viable recovery plan. Um, it's no good having a very good plan that fails to operate. So these plans need to be practiced 
along with other safety plans, obviously, on board the vessel. Now, the thing about the cyber is that uh, whilst it may provoke an engine failure or, or failure of some piece of kit that is obvious, it also may not. And whilst um, the, and the issue for the IMO's coverage is that it doesn't cover things like crime. So there may well be hacks on the system which lead to the stealing of personal data or money. Um, now, that may not be a safety issue, but it would still be disruptive if it was the crew that was targeted, for example. And um, most of the uh, guidelines that have been issued follow a reasonably uh, useful standard practice, which is the NIST framework of basically having five buckets, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Now, clearly there are three that are sort of preemptive and two that are after the fact, but uh, the reason for that is you have to cover all the bases in this point. There's no good in having a bunch of protection mechanisms if they fail and uh, you are unable to respond. So you have to look at all of them in turn and basically in parallel. So if you look at the next slide. So uh, we have five main pieces of activity in this area. So firstly, as I said, we have to identify who is responsible for what and make sure we understand which systems we're talking about, which assets, which data flows and capabilities that if they get disrupted for whatever reason, and cyber is one of them, pose a risk to ship operations. So that means you have to look at the key critical systems, propulsion, steering, ballast, all of those systems that you know and love from a safety perspective will now have to have a cyber risk assessment uh, done for them as well. Clearly then, once you've identified these risks, you need to put control measures in place that will allow you to protect these systems. And these will include, uh, these could include technical measures, these could include process measures or physical security measures, that will all be um, germane to um, help either reduce the impact of a cyber event or prevent it from happening. The key obviously is contingency planning. If you've got a failover or backup, what are you gonna do if something goes wrong and you have detected a cyber attack, have you got backup capability um, from your uh, network suppliers, for example? So clearly you will be able to manage the risk and if you can't deal with it, if it takes the system out, you've got a backup plan. Detection is, is more tricky for the older ships, I would argue, because their networks may not be um, as uh, penetrating or as fast as the modern ships that now come on stream. But clearly you will need to be able to understand what normal looks on your network. What is the regular heartbeat of the, of the boat, of the vessel? What is the regular heartbeat of the system? And detect anomalies. So if people are using the welfare network, for example, for the wrong kind of thing, if you suddenly see data going out of the vessel when you'd expect to see it coming in, these need to be tracked and recognized for what they are. There will obviously be false positives, but clearly you need to keep an eye on what is happening on your networks, whether it's from head office or elsewhere. Now, clearly, uh, ship owners are clear that there is a, sometimes that there is no direct connection with the vessel, but actually there is, it's called the internet, and there is direct communication between head office and the vessel, which usually comes down a trusted corridor and because that corridor is trusted, uh, you may not net recognize that there is malicious traffic until it's too late. So you have to have both ends of the pipe protected as well as the pipe itself. Um, in terms of respond activities, clearly there will be standard response plans for engine failure and this kind of thing. But you will have to make sure that there are also steps taken to identify, or at least try to identify, whether a cyber attack is the proximate cause. Um, and that may be that somebody's noticed that the ECDIS was very slow, or there was some issue with a system that was not necessarily mechanical, um, but there needs to be recognized that this may be another type of issue that is occurring and that the uh, IT people need to make sure they understand what's going on to be able to identify any precursor signals that may happen that uh, indicate that malware is at work. Um, clearly, you know, they will need to understand how to bring systems back, whether they've got backups on board or they can draw down backups from a, uh, a location um, via a satellite cable, satellite link, perhaps. We'll have to see. Um, recovery, obviously, is vital when the vessel has had an attack that has knocked something out and there needs to be a backup plan. So if your ECDIS has gone down, you need to be able to use dead reckoning with charts to make sure that you don't stray into areas where you shouldn't or hit reefs where you shouldn't be anywhere near. And uh, you know there are some companies that have said to us proudly that they've got rid of their 
charts and rely on Ectus solely. And I think we're, our view has been that they probably need to put the charts back just in case. Um, so clearly re recovery plans need to be credible and, and practiced. You know, there's no good in having a plan if you don't know it's working. Um, and obviously the inspector will be looking for those. So if we go to the next slide. So each nation will be interpreting these rules slightly differently. And I think that's one of the issues that we have to be aware of. Um, and it depends on, you will have to know what uh, practices and procedures your ports of call will actually want to um, adopt um, with regards to audits and spot checks and cyber security. Clearly the US and the UK have been pretty out front in terms of specifying what they will do. Um, the US Coast Guard recently issued a, an edict on the 27th of October in which basically they set out their policy in three lines. If they find, find a serious deficiency uh, that is, um, for example, if there was a failure of um, cyber security that wasn't covered in an SMS plan and it led to a significant issue or breach, they could impound the vessel. And there are various forms of impounding, whether they impound the vessel and demand rectification there and then, or whether they say, if you come back with your vessel in that state, um, you, you won't be allowed back or we'll seize you. Um, they, they, they're being very unambiguous about it and, you know, as they have a right to be, and they've clearly taken the view that, that you've had three and a half years to deal with this issue. If you come into one of our ports and you're not ready, then that will restrict your ability to trade and we will deny you um, the right to sail in our waters. So the US are being very f firm about it. And the UK are taking the view that this doesn't only apply to, to um, large vessels, this applies to every vessel um, and that they expect to see um, top-down management commitment to this in their audits as well as um, making sure that people in being audited understand what their roles and responsibilities are and to be trained appropriately. One of the things we see in, in, in looking at um, our, you know, sort of uh, clients environments is that training is a, is a very variable beast. And it is very important that your people have the right training and know what to do in a case of an emergency, not only from a mechanical failure point of view, for example, but also if you suspect a cyber attack, what are they expected to know and do, um, if anything, and it may be that they don't have a role, but if they do have a role, they are um, expected to react appropriately. And clearly they will need, you will need also to um, understand that the UK could put a major non-conformity on you if they find you lacking as well. So that may well mean that you are forbidden from sailing. So, it is very important that we all recognize that the penalties for failure to comply are reasonably significant and could impede, impede your ability to trade. And it's very important that steps are taken, um, if they haven't been already, that uh, you can demonstrate that there is a, a plan in place and that you've got steps that you need to take in order to be compliant. Um, now, you know, we as Astara, if you go to the next slide, please, can, also, can obviously help you in that domain as a um as a as both an advisory business and an insurance business and clearly it's in our interest to help our customers be compliant with the rules and regulations because otherwise if they're not compliant they will maybe um, lose their insurances so we want to be able to help you get to your capabilities appropriately look at where you are and then look at what you need to be and where, what you need to do um, and this is an ongoing thing Cybersecurity is not a one-off activity, it's not a one-off purchase, it's a, it's a relationship. And we are obviously very keen to ensure that our clients stay cyber hygienic, if you like the term, and continue to operate on the basis of uh, appropriate safeguards and um, following the regulations. This doesn't mean over-investing, it is very easy to spend too much money on cyber security um, and you buy ca kit and capability that produces so much data you cannot interpret it. We're very much of the view that the data needs to be appropriate to the risk and the need, and people need to know what they need to know in order to be able to, to function. Um, we, in our advisory work, will obviously need to see evidence of what you've done so far in order to be able to help you as to ascertain how far you have to get to, uh, to where you need to be to be compliant. Um, but we will look at your environment both internally and externally. Um, we will check your defences and make sure that what you're doing is appropriate and that your uh, obvious points of entry are closed off to only, the, only, only available to those who have the right credentials. 
and we'll obviously be able to give you a review of your insurances against these benchmarks to make sure that you are appropriately covered. Uh, it's very easy to buy some insurance and find that actually you don't have the certainty you need. So to recap, um, the IMO requirements are real. They're now, um, they will affect vessels if you are found wanting. Um, we don't want you to be in that situation. And we, there are um, organizations out there, including us, who can help you arrive at those benchmarks and make sure that you pass your audits successfully. Um, and basically the rest is up to you. You know what the penalties are, you know what the rules are, and uh, we would like to ensure that uh, you continue to sail safely and profitably. Thank you very much and back to Simon. Thank you very much, Bill. I appreciate it. An in-depth discussion and a lot more knowledge than we had before we started. So we now move on to the next, per um, our next presenter, which is Chris South. He's a senior underwriter for the West. He's been there for many years and has a vast experience. And he's going to give us a, a viewpoint of the risks that we have with these new regulations and rules coming in from a, an insurance perspective. So please, Chris, go ahead. Thank you, Simon. Uh, first, first slide, please. The fact that we're speaking to you today um, on a webinar is an indication of how our lives have changed and that we're now all dependent on digital systems. And this is a, such a, a quantum leap in the way working world happens. It's happening to us as office people, it's happening to the ships, which as has been alluded to by my previous, previous speakers. As we all know, the ISM code has been mandatory for the majority of ocean-going vessels for quite a long time now. And this requires audits of the vessel and offices in order for companies to obtain their document compliance and safety management certificate. As Bill has pointed out from the 1st of January, in the safety management systems, cyber resilience, cyber security has to be built in. And this is a mandatory requirement and will be audited. And that auditing is the responsibility of flag state who may carry out the auditing through a government agency or through a delegated responsible organization such as an IAX class society. Next slide, please. Uh, Bill pointed out the IMO issued guidelines back in July 2017. And I think initially many people didn't realize the full breadth and extent of what those guidelines contained. And when I uh, lectured on cyber risks a couple of years ago, people were still quite surprised they were there. And I think it's only now that the January deadline is approaching, people are beginning to look at this really seriously. But there are big implications. The starting point has to be the IMO guidelines, because that is what the SNS must be based on in general terms. To move on. In response to the guidelines, next slide, the industry, sorry, the industry issued numerous uh, guidelines to try and help, often quite confusing. Here are the two leading ones they were issued, but these were only documents to give advice and assistance. But if we look to who's actually going to be most likely doing the audit, if it's not a government agency, it's going to be a class society. Next slide. So earlier this year, the International Association of Classification Societies issued their recommendation for cyber resilience. And fortunately, all IAX societies have signed up to the same document as the core basic document. And this probably is one of the most critical documents to review before you have your cyber audit, particularly if it's going to be by an IAX class. This recommendation was issued um, to support the Almaya resolution and the guidelines. And it's designed to achieve cyber resilient ships, not only just so you can pass your audit, but also to maintain cyber resilience throughout the service life of the vessel. And of course, the vessel will be regularly audited. But don't forget, this requires to systems that are subject to requirements of class and is essentially about safety. It doesn't necessarily affect your commercial viability, it's to do with the safety of the ships, but it is a key core document. Next slide. If we look at class itself, the classification society may be the uh, recognized organization to do the IMSM, ISM audit to get your document of compliance and safety management certificate. It doesn't have to be. All class societies recognize other organizations. 
e.g. flag state may have to do it themselves. But to actually obtain your class certificate, I've taken a quote here from the DNBGL. Uh, they say straight away, you must require comply with the requirements given by flag state. You must have your documents of compliance as applicable under conventions. Therefore, to ha have class, you have to have your ISM certificates in place. It's a condition of class. So that's critical because after you look on to the next slide, class is also a critical problem of hull policies. Now I've taken the examples here from two hull policies. The first, the ITC 84, well known, still widely used, actually implemented before uh, the ISM code, but you will note that it's, it has the condition that the cover will terminate automatically if your class is suspended, changed, uh, discontinuance, etc. So again, your class is dependent upon ISM and you have to have class to maintain your hull cover. If we look at the more recent, not yet widely adopted, but more recent clauses, the International Hull Clause is 2003, slight variation on wording, at the inception and throughout the period of cover, class must be maintained, and then has the, the same conditions about change, suspension, discontinuance. But interestingly, the hull clauses, these hull clauses, post ISM, introduce two new subconditions owners or the party assuming responsibility for the operation of the vessel from owners must have that office document of compliance. So the ship managers, etc. And the vessel must also have safety management certificates. So these HAL clauses specifically refer to the ISM documents. It's a big step forward in the HAL terms and conditions rather than the rather wider, loosely interpretable um, ITC 84 clauses the 2003 ones are specifically referring to ISM through these two subclauses. Uh, next slide. If we look at the Norwegian Hull Plan, now our, our Scandinavian friends, I'm sure many of whom are listening, are much kinder in their wording, should we say, than uh, British wording, but they still say that loss of class, it, it does refer to when insurance commences, the ship has to be classed and insurance will terminate. So in effect, has the same effect as the uh, ITC wordings and the hull policy wordings I've just shown you, the maintenance of class is critically important under the Norwegian Reinsurance Plan, and hence the maintenance of your ISM documents is essential to maintain class. If we then look next, if we then look at the p &I clubs, the p &I clubs, the 13 clubs of us in the international group ensure about 90% of the world's ocean going shipping, and we have essentially, as many of you will know, the same terms and conditions. And we all specify that vessels must maintain class throughout the period of entry, and they must also have the valid, the valid certificates required by flag state. So your PNI is also dependent on class, and the class is dependent upon ISM certification. So they, it's a critical chain in which to reach your insurances, you must have the documents in place class and your statutory certificates. Next. If we move across now, let's look at lo loss of hire charter parties. Nearly all charter parties have an off hire clause. I have taken here just an example from the NYP 1946, which you know talks about breakdown of machinery, etc., or by any other clause preventing the working of the vessel. So if your vessel has a complete systems failure, because of a cyber uh, attack or a virus somehow entering the system, the vessel would not be capable of working and therefore will be placed off hire. The owner, it may take quite a considerable time to restore a, a cyber attack uh, of virus infected computer systems on a ship. The vessels off hire, the, mayor, the owner may then look to his traditional loss of hire or delay insurances. Can I recover whilst my vessel is detained? And the answer is probably not because these policies traditionally require there to be insured peril or damage to the vessel. And I don't think these policies envisage that a computer systems failure preventing the vessel working would be uh, an event insured peril which would give rise to a right to a claim under the loss of hire or delay insurance. And restoring computer systems on a ship can take a considerable period of time, as I will allude to in my last slide at the end of my presentation. Next slide, please. 
We then have the problem under the Hague rules in the contracts of carriage, as, as everybody knows. Um, the owner has a duty to exercise due diligence to make the vessel seaworthy before the commencement of the voyage. So what is due diligence? Taking reasonable precautions to see the vessel is fit for the voyage and contemplated. But the question then is what is cyber due diligence? Because if the ship has a systems failure, cyber systems failure, it may be deemed to have been unseaworthy due to inadequate protection of the ship's systems. And that creates a real problem. Obviously, potentially ship owners may say, well, I've got my SMS certificate. Is that going to be enough? And the argument is probably not. If we look at the next slide, there's a lot of industry knowledge already about what could be due diligence. Whether a vessel seaworthy or not depends on also upon prevailing industry practice. Now, since January 2018, the oil industry SIRE program post the issuance of the ISN guidelines in 2017, the SIRE program has had for tanker owners and operators already a requirement for cyber risk security in their policies and procedures, internal audit cyber program, and retain cyber specialist support. Therefore, the tanker industry already has standards that an owner or a tanker owner could be judged against potentially, because whilst this is a requirement to comply with the SIRE program, it is industry knowledge and may be deemed to be industry practice in the context of looking at unseaworthiness. And for the dry trade, right ship have incorporated uh, inspection in their inspection report, cyber security section, not as strongly worded, but requiring safety, cyber safety security and environment and risk management in the checklists. So there's, even the dry sector has an industry knowledge. So ISM compliance post uh, January is a legal standard. It's a bare minimum against which the owner can be judged. But holding the document of compliance itself doesn't equate to due diligence. Obviously, it is the, what is happening on the ship at the commencement of the voyage. So it's an ongoing obligation to maintain your cybersecurity on the ship to show that you've exercised due diligence before the voyage in question. Next slide. Increasingly, owners are going to face, or carriers are going to face problems of cybersecurity clauses coming into their contracts. Whether it's the contracts with suppliers, as was alluded to by Simon with a bunker supplier potentially, or actually in your charter party chain. And BIMCO issued last year their cybersecurity clause. I haven't seen it widely adopted yet, but I think increasingly cybersecurity clauses will become into charter parties, particularly where there is a digital interchange of data between the carrier and the, and the owner or the charter and the owner, as is increasingly happening in many trades. Now, the, the BIMCO clause says fairly loosely that the parties must implement appropriate cybersecurity. Not particularly clear what that is, but they have to have a procedure and they have to use reasonable endeavors to use and ensure that any third party providing services in connection with the charter party also has cyber security. So therefore, potentially a charterer who's a, a, a buying the bunkers may have to ensure that the bunker supplier has cyber security. So that if there's a data interchange between the ship and the bunker supplier, there's a protection built into that, but that would be the responsibility of the charters to show they'd exercise some reasonable endeavors. Now, obviously, in the event of an incident where the BIMCO clause is there, owners will be tested to see if their SMS system is compliant, e.g. has cyber resilience built in, and has been followed. The harder question, and I can't actually say what the answer is at this stage, is what standards would a charter be judged against? How do they prove they've implemented appropriate cyber security? Would the charter have to show that they comply with the national standards of the countries in which they're based? USA, UK have national standards for cybersecurity applying to industry. Would the charter have to show that they were complying with those standards to show that they had exercised reasonable endeavors and implemented appropriate procedures? I think cybersecurity clauses are going to become increasingly common in our contractual relations that we, we see going forwards. And often there will be indemnities in those agreements. So that if you pass an infection on, you may be uh, obliged to identify to whom you sent the infection. Conversely, 
if you receive the infection, you may find that you can't sue because you've given a waiver. So these clauses have to be taken very seriously because they will become increasingly common, not only in shipping, but in standard commercial practice. Next slide. Now, Bill has alluded to, and I apologize to the amount of writing here, but the US has issued its guidelines on cybersecurity, which Bill referred to. And the critical point is, in each case, a ship will be detained and may require external audits, rectification prior to departure, and or it, the vessel has to be clear within three months or before returning to the US. Now, this may take time. And whilst the vessel is det delayed, detained, you will not be able to recover, as I explained previously, under a loss of hire or delay insurance. Now, it can take a long time to restore cyber systems. There is a scarcity of experts in the world to do this work. It's extremely complicated and the delays can be quite significant. So the delays by port state detention are things to try and avoid at all costs because you will lose time, time is money, and it will damage corporate reputation and your relationships as well. Next slide, please. Now this is just slightly random. Most of the world seems to be obsessed with football. And I've taken an example here of Manchester United, the richest football club in the world, or one of the richest. It's had a massive cyber disruption attack at uh, the end of last month. And these are some of the headlines taken from the internet. Now look, there is Manchester United with its resources, its wealth. And even there it says, disruption continues two weeks after the cyber attack started. And interestingly, there's also an important announcement there, Manchester United hit by cyber attack that says fan data safe. Why is that so important? Because of GDPR, General Data Protection Regulations, the loss of personal information. And under the GPDR in, in Europe, the fines can be staggering. They can be 2% of your turnover or up to 4% of your turnover in the case of a bad breach, which you haven't notified. Now, you can imagine a British airline, British Airways had a big data loss. Their fine originally was 184 million pounds based on their previous turnover. Now, shipping companies, you have a lot of data. You have data on your crew, potentially on your passengers and your customers. If you lose that data, you could be exposed to significant fines, not just in Europe, but in many countries have data protection regulations. That leak of data might originate from your ship. It might be where the weak point into your corporate systems is bad cybersecurity in your ship. So you need to be aware that that could lead to data loss. And on the right hand side of your screen is also a warning that was issued to Manchester United that potentially paying ransomware, you know, if your systems are frozen and you receive a ransom demand, paying ransomware could be illegal because you may be paying your ransom to the cyber hackers who've attacked your system. They may be a sanctioned entity, it may be supporting terrorism. And if you or your financial institution or cyber insurance firms pay ransom without making sure it's not it's clear by OFAC, not only would that, that be a payment, you could also incur a fine. And there, uh, OFAC warned Manchester United, they could be paying a 50 million pound fine if they pay a ransom that was not clear to OFAC to make sure it was not an illegal payment. So the payment of the ransom itself may be illegal. The fine that you get for paying the ransom would not be recoverable. So here is my last example, a major company, huge resources, bigger resources than many shipping companies, and they're still having problems two weeks after the attack, and they've been warned about the risks of payment of fine. So in conclusion, the risks we face are significant. They should not be underestimated. Companies are getting attacked. We've referred to MERSC, but also MSC, CMA have all had big attacks recently with very significant financial losses. One of those companies, I understand, had to buy thousands and thousands of laptops because it was cheaper and quicker to buy new laptops to reload data than it was to try and debug the existing uh, systems that were contaminated. Imagine the similar problems on your ship. So the, the SMS requirements for cyber resilience is the starting point. 
they have to be in place. You will be judged on them by port state control. Having those certificates in place is, depends, will, is a prerequisite for your class certification. Class certification is a prerequisite for your hull cover. It's also a prerequisite for your PI cover, along with having the SMS documents. If you have a cyber attack because you've got weak systems, your ship will be delayed, potentially a significant period of time. That delay would not be recoverable from insurance policies. If you have a loss that leads to a cargo loss, you may have problems under the Hague rules if you can't show you've exercised proper due diligence. It has to be taken seriously. This comes as a big shock to people in my generation. If we were here 10 years ago, we wouldn't be having a cyber seminar. We would be talking at a conference and having a nice round of drinks afterwards, which sadly we can't do to do today. It's a changed world and the rate of change is going to accelerate. It's exciting, but it's dangerous. And that's really the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Fascinating talk, and I appreciate the way that you managed to get Man U into the talk somehow when we we're talking about ships. So well done. So I've come on to our final speaker now, and that is Howard Potter. He is the head of cyber and rights underwriting for Astara and has recently joined Astara. Howard, I believe that Astara has it has the number one integrated cyber solution for the ship owners, the ports, and offshore charters. Maybe this is an opportunity for you to elaborate onto that area for us. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, and good morning to those of you in Europe. Good afternoon, if you're tuning in from Asia. Good to have you online. Um, so this section of the webinar was, was actually described just last week by Robert Dorry, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Astara as, and I quote, the divine shining light. Um, now, I'm pretty sure that he wasn't talking about me, uh, more the subject matter. And yes, we are talking about insurance here, so it's a lot to live up to, but, but that we shall. Um, I think with a little more modesty, instead of calling it the divine shining light, uh, I'm going to call it the cyber insurance challenge. And so if we go to the next slide, what is that actual challenge as we see it? Well, essentially, we have all over the world, marine markets which either are excluding cyber risk or which are selling it back in a limited way, quite frankly, without full due attention to things like the non-malicious element of the risk. Remember, the original exclusion is for malicious acts, whereas quite often uh, negligence or genuine mistake is the key issue. Uh, not taking account fully of the war, and by this I mean primarily the confiscation element, uh, and, and also the entire land-based office element of the risk. And then conversely, on the other side of this little picture of a bridge here, we have a well-developed commercial cyber market, which understandably is less comfortable with maritime assets moving around the world, subject to maritime law and conventions, everything that we know and love. And so the challenge really is to bridge the two. If the bridge had a name, perhaps I'd call it the bridge of expertise, uh, because that's essentially what it's all about. The end game, an insurance solution which has to, by its nature, combine the ship and the shore-based cyber exposures. Because at the end of the day, cyber is cyber, and just as computers are connected, the internet's connected, business is connected, so too must the insurance be connected. So just moving on to the, the next slide, I think it's important to acknowledge that there are alternatives out there. But for me, really, this is about certainty versus uncertainty. Uh, simple buybacks, in our opinion, represent uncertainty. Uh, we've talked briefly about war covers and confiscation. The fact, for instance, that you're only buying back vessel damage caused by cyber, which as of itself has not caused a major casualty. Silent covers uh, or silent cyber, where it's simply not mentioned at all in an insurance policy, fairly obviously represent uncertainty as people like the United Kingdom's Prudential Regulatory Authority have already opined on. 
Uh, and I think that cover which is written blind without an in-depth cyber review or on some kind of self or third party certification basis also represents uncertainty, especially in the event of a claim when perhaps the attack is undertaken in a novel manner that wasn't quite what was expected. Moving from right to left across the page, certainty can of course be achieved with an out and out exclusion, but of course that is not a solution. Um, only true certainty for the issues that the previous speakers have been talking about is achieved where cyber becomes the actual subject matter of the insurance. And that's what we call an affirmative cyber policy. So on to the next slide. Having established that we need an affirmative cyber policy and an integrated ship shore insurance policy, what would that actually achieve in practice? Firstly, as we said on the last slide, what happens is cyber becomes the peril that forms the coverage grant under the policy. It solves those problems of where terrorism, uh, where terrorism is covered, whether war confiscation is covered, or whether the loss was due to a tired and distracted human being who made a genuine mistake. All these become solved issues because instead of arguing, as we used to do, which clauses and buybacks cover or exclude war, civil war, terrorism, proxy war, which is happening everywhere all the time. Um, we're instead saying that we're agnostic to that because the cause is a cyber intrusion. Could equally be a, a kid in his pajamas, a bored teenager or a disgruntled former employee. The point really is that the end result for you is the same, it's a loss. And so what we say is cyber is cyber. Then the integrated chip and short part of what we were talking about. Now, I think it's, it's always a good thing if an insurance policy actually reflects the business that it's meant to be insuring. Uh, it is at the end of the day, one business. And so obviously you want to er eradicate coverage gaps. And I think in cyber particularly, you don't want two sets of risk management, one for computers and kit on the ship, one for your offices. And so too, the claims proposition also should be identical in the event that something goes wrong. Therefore, you have a policy that reflects what you actually do. You do more than just run ships. It might be logistics operations, quite a big part of it. it. Might be ports and terminals, mining, whatever. Essentially, it's one enterprise with ultimately one balance sheet, and that's insurance's role to protect that. I'd add that at Astara, we add an additional perspective to this, um, which is a writing business alongside review uh, of, of people like Bill Edgerton that you heard from earlier and his team. So we would underwrite marine cyber cover on the basis of a statement of known fact agreed between you and us. And what that means is no arguments in the event of a claim because we've based cover on our mutually agreed factual basis of your cyber risk and not on that self or third party certification. And I think that's something to add to the certainty box that we had on the last slide. And this essentially is our club-like proposition because we don't believe that an, a cyber insurance policy is something that's agreed and then put away on a shelf for 364 days and a renewal premium bill. In the intervening time, cyber criminals are trying to stay ahead of the game Therefore, cyber attacks are constantly evolving. So whilst I imagine Bill and his team have probably not been described as guardian angels before, that's exactly what they are. Uh, now, they can't prevent everything. No guardian angel can, but they can try to. Uh, and what we see this is, um, is as a constant relationship during the currency of the insurance policy, there for you, ahead of the curve, the idea of being proactive before the loss and not reactive after a loss. So moving on to the next page, in summary, uh, this is what such an integrated and affirmative insurance policy would not and would cover. Now, okay, this is very much uh, a binary comparison between a straightforward hull insurance policy and our full suite of clauses, but you can see the difference laid bare and acknowledging that in the market, there is a lot of murky gray brown water between the two. But you can see the main heads of cover there, damage to the ship itself, business interruption. And I'm very, uh, very uh, purposefully using those words, not loss of hire, full enterprise business interruption. Office, 
IT infrastructure damage, data restoration, et cetera, et cetera. So if we move to the next slide, what does this policy look like? Well, that's what it looks like. It's what page one looks like anyway. And in, in, in essence, it's a very simple idea. The driver is a cyber incident, and that's defined very simply, very straightforward as unauthorized acts or activities. Causation can then be malicious or malicious with negligent contribution. Four, your ships, your loss of hire and war, if these are insured for non-cyber perils, uh, and uh, ports and terminals if required. And this is physical damage. Then you add on top of that, if you think of those as a foundation, the building that you add on top of that is the enterprise cyber coverage. So what do we mean by enterprise cyber coverage? And that's on the next slide. It's what we call cyber defense and remediation. So things like notification costs, cyber defense costs, forensic costs, reputational uh, or costs to repair reputational damage, uh, public relations after a loss. Then you have first party cover for damaged IT assets, computers, laptops, kit, perhaps reprogramming, possibly dealing with disablement of systems or systems with impaired integrity and a full indemnity. Then you have the costs of restoring data, uh, if relevant, legal protection due to the loss of personal data, which we touched on earlier in the, in the presentations. And then loss of revenue or business interruption. And in reality, if I perhaps could have made this bullet point twice the size and in red, uh, it might have been a sign. And I, and I think the point there is that what we know is that this is the biggest driver of loss. It's the biggest driver of exposure under policies. Uh, and it's also the biggest part of the premium. With that, and I don't believe it can be divorced from it, ransomware and the costs of unlawful demands. Now, why put the two together uh, with, um, with the business interruption? And it's because ransomware claims represent the biggest erosion of limits on cyber insurance policies uh, and because of the business interruption they cause, but also that the loss mitigation and prevention work for both essentially is broadly similar. So it makes sense for those two to go together. E-theft also covered under the policy, cover included so long as there is a system of multi-factor authentication, which is the skin in the game that we need you to have to cover this. And finally, some optional extensions for cover, things like dependent organizations and service providers, where we can review your contracts and mutual indemnities as well, cover for contractual liability, so on and so forth. So if we move on to the next slide, like any policy, it would be remiss of me to say what was excluded under the policy. But I think the point here, and what I do feel, is it's very indicative of the simplicity and the direct approach of this kind of insurance policy, and the cover it gives, that these either fall into very obvious brackets of things which are covered elsewhere, and more properly elsewhere, such as bodily injury or pollution under p &I or under a DNO policy, um, or they are clearly against public policy or simply uninsurable as is standard anywhere, such as sanctions, uh, radioactive contamination, or they're just not the point of this policy. There are other policies out there. So cyber war, okay, fine, it's a cyber policy. Non-cyber war, kinetic war, well, no, that's what other in, uh, non-cyber insurance policies are there for. So I think the point of this really is to say that the coverage is simple uh, and it does what it says on the tin. The exclusions are nothing that you wouldn't expect to see there. Moving on to the next slide and conscious of time, just a quick note on our security. We have a binder with full underwriting authority, which is led by Axis Specialty Europe and then Convex both A-rated, non-Lloyds, London company market entities. And all the necessary hygiene factors uh, like global, uh, global licensing so that we can write business around the world. Um, and also the fact that we will have our own EU domiciled entity so that European risks post Brexit on the 1st of January are not a problem either. A complete hygiene factor, of course, but I do feel important to mention it to set your minds at rest. And so to conclude, last slide. We've talked about 
a total enterprise balance sheet protection being the goal. <clears throat> Constantly backed up with wraparound risk management and consultancy, ships and offices, it's one business. So put the protection in one place. And therefore, when something happens, who are you going to call? Well, maybe not Ghostbusters, but certainly your PI club, potentially your Hull and Machinery lead insurers and broker. And if cyber is the cause, Astara. Will cyber increasingly be that cause in the years to come? You know, I'm not sure I'm even going to say it because I think you know the answer and it's written there anyway. But what I do hope that we've all managed to do in these presentations today is show that, as the old saying goes, worse things happen at sea. In reality, really, really, really bad things happen on the internet as well. And what we all on this panel have uh, in common are different ways of fighting that. So uh, my thanks, and I'm gonna hand back to Simon. Thank you very much, Howard. Very interesting, and I think it's a lot for people to think about. So we're gonna move on to the sections questions. I'm going to add in one more panelist, I guess is the correct phrase for it. Uh, Rob Dory, who is the group CEO for Astara, he's going to join us as well. He's here for the really difficult questions that the rest of us can't answer. So the first question I've had several times is, can, they, can we um, send out a copy of the slides and the recording and or the recording, depending on the question person? Yes, there will be uh, the slides sent out and also a copy of the recording at the uh, some point today or tomorrow, I guess, or to the email for the people who, uh, the participants who joined onto this web call. So thanks very much. So we have a few questions. So I will start with, um, this is this best for? for Chris, I think this is best for, are there any restrictions on the P&I cover under, for cyber risk, Chris? Right. At the moment, there are no exclusions in the PI policy for a PI claim arising out of a cyber risk. And that is because there are no exclusions in the international group's reinsurance contract. Where it, the water gets muddier is if the cyber incident is in the nature of a terrorist or war, where then cover would be excluded, except for a very limited. Uh, cover provided for liabilities to crew that you can't recover from your traditional war risk underwriters because of a cyber exclusion. But as it stands at the moment, there are no exclusions in the PI policy for PI claims arising as a result of a cyber incident, except in the instance of a war risk. Thank you, Chris. Um, Bill, I think this one is probably for you. Okay. How does transportation, how does the transportation sector measure up against other sectors? That's an interesting one. I get it all the time in terms of people wanting to know where they stand in a league table of, of difficulty or, or, or ease. Um, to my mind, I think actually it's not, that's not the right question. Um, the question is more about, you know, the individual organisation. What do I need to do to be safer? Um, Transportation, if you look at the IBM reports, comes around 10th um, in the league table. Um, and, you know, that is, you know, it's a meaningless statistic, really, because it doesn't really matter where you're on the table. The fact is that that position puts their breaches averaging at about $3.6 million a head, as opposed to the average of 3.9. Um, so, you know, that tells you something. I don't know what it tells you particularly. I think the most important point is that there are imperatives on the transport sector now to do things about their cyber hygiene. Um, and um, it doesn't really matter what healthcare or, or aeros aerospace and defense are doing because you have to do them anyway. And I would suggest that, uh, you know, we, let's focus on the real issues which are you know, fixing these problems before they bite us. Okay, thank you very much, Bill. Um, Next question, da, 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 da. Uh, one for Rob, I think. What impact does cyber risk management have on the premium or terms? Thank you, 
Simon, and thank you, West, actually, for allowing us to share the platform. Um, like, like many things uh, in the world of insurance, uh, risk management uh, is about demonstrating operational control. Operational control is designed to manage what we would describe as the attritional risk in uh, a premium, um, and hopefully also mitigate the occasional larger loss. Uh, what we would expect um, is that through our risk management activities, we would be reducing and I'm going to come up with a round number between 50 to 60 percent of the, the the sort of low scale um, cyber activity that leads to defense and remediation expenses, typically of the cost around well, the cost of the company of around what, like 500,000 to a million dollars any one event. So we think there's a material saving to be made for uh, premium uh, where there is evidence of good quality risk management. And what we wouldn't say is that all risk management um, at a, the highest standard will get rid of all claims. You can never say that. Uh, zero, day, zero day events, uh, which are events for which are the first time a particular vulnerability has been exposed across a global internet. Um, maybe uh, what we would call catastrophe risk type claims in terms of premium allocation. Uh, we clearly need to rate premium for that risk, uh, and that is one that really ship owners, ports operators, offshore contractors may not be able to stop the event from happening, but with really good risk management, they can make the, the losses arising from that materially lower. So um, I hope that sort of answers your question, Simon. The answer is essentially it will reduce the risk and will reduce the uh, premium that we would demand. Perfect. Thanks for that. Robert's a good answer. Okay, I think I've got one for you, Howard. In the event of a breach, third party ship managers network, does the owner have possible recourse against the manager under the BIMCO shipman? Does the Astara policy cover the third party manager as well as the owner? It, one of the um, <clears throat> one of the phrases that I put in there was dependent organisation when I was talking earlier, and uh, it, it's part of the underwriting, part of the risk management uh, that whoever our client was, we would be looking at the dependent organisations, the uh, the dependent contracts that are in there, and to, to some extent that involves a, an extra level of underwriting of another party. Um, but uh, it, th that would be almost a bespoke part of it if we were looking at that. Good. I think that answered that one. Thank you very much, Howard. Uh, Bill, another one for you. Um, could you define what resilience is? Um, you're on mute at the moment, Bill, if you could unmute yourself, please. Resilience is about the ability of an organization to recover from an attack. Um, and basically the, uh, the uh, domestic law enforcement agencies in the UK, for example, are very uh, keen on resilience and making sure that there is not only individual company resilience, but national resilience in various sectors. So uh, resilience is the ability to withstand an attack and make sure you can continue to function um, and deliver your uh, outcomes that you are either contracted to or, or obliged to and i think it's you know it sits quite neatly in this chain in terms of the recovery and respond area which is all about resilience perfect i think that's uh, responded to that question well um rob one for you i think does good cyber management sorry i'll start again i'll try and read the question properly this time does good cyber risk management improve other elements of the risk profile of the company Definitely. Yeah, um, a very good question. Um, clearly, the, the better your risk management, uh, clearly that you materially make your, uh, your financial losses less. Um, one of the areas where we get a frequent amount of questioning is, does good cyber risk management materially improve DNO premium? Uh, so for listed companies, it's undoubtedly the case that where there has been a cyber incident and, for example, there may be a less than perfect uh, statement to the stock exchange, which causes 
um, investors to lose confidence, leading to a reduction in share price. Uh, and there is evidence to support um, that losses up to 30% in share price are about an industry standard and in, certainly in the United States. Um, you know, can you improve investor confidence with good cyber uh, risk management? Yes, is the answer. If you have firstly uh, been able to demonstrate that you've got business interruption insurance for a cyber event, you will be clearly telling your DNO side C underwriters that actually a cyber event should not lead to a sizable side C DNO claim, i.e., that is a claim brought by investors for loss of market value arising from this particular act of corporate negligence. There's another element to that, which is uh, investors uh, can occasionally sue directors individually uh, in their corporate capacity as a director of a company where they fail to implement the right policies and procedures to manage a risk. Um, clearly, uh, if you can evidence that you have had an external val validation of your cyber enterprise risk management policies and procedures, you can rebut that claim very, very simply. Uh, ultimately, if you also then go on to buy business interruption insurance, you can also demonstrate you're managing the balance sheet of the risk as well. Uh, clearly, the, the theme to both of those is evidencing good cyber enterprise risk management. That will take a substantial part of the oxygen of DNO rate rise, which is extremely severe at the current state of the insurance market. This is something that will help balance the discussion with your DNO underwriters. So it won't take away all the premium. Uh, I'm afraid there are other losses in the DNO market which cannot be cured by good cyber enterprise risk management, but you can take and mitigate a substantial proportion of that rise by evidencing you are managing cyber risk properly. Good, thank you very much for the, the in-depth answer. Rob, I appreciate that. Um, Howard, I think this one is for you. Will a star uh, undertake a cyber risk assessment prior to binding cover, or do they just simply recognise a uh, valid DOC and SMC? Well, yes, we do. Uh, we do very much so. And I think it's important, it, it ties into the comments Rob was just making, that there is more to it. There are uh, more potential losses that, that can happen that would be covered under an insurance policy. Um, that would simply be identified as part of the um, uh, the SMS review or audit. So yes, we would do that. Uh, very much not on the basis to add another layer of things that uh, that, that need to be dealt with, but uh, but on a uh, on a two way risk management advice basis um, that that leads to um, the right kind of insurance cover as well. So yes, we would do our own assessment. Perfect. Thank you. Um, uh, it's actually another one for you. Bit of a longer one. Um, uh, we uh, Our new vessel will be received in two months and has to sail to high risk area known for many piracy tax. What do you suggest? And then the follow on part to that question is, is ship hostaging by any political branch, political aims on board dealt with under this policy? Uh, that, that last bit is not really a cyber loss, I don't think, unless I've misunderstood that. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the specifics, uh, maybe that's a better conversation to have offline afterwards, uh, because it sounds like quite a specific situation. I think you're probably right. So to yeah. the, the person with that question, if you contact us separately after that, we'll get make sure you get put through to the right person. Um, what is the cost of a cyber risk assessment? Bill or Rob, I guess one of you. Rob, do you want to take that? Yeah, um, we actually have two cyber risk products currently available uh, immediately. Um, the first is what we call Cyber Start. That is um, basically a, a two week review in round numbers, uh, provided people are available to um, fill out questionnaires and be available for interview. Um, essentially, CyberStart is a penetration test, so we'll test the external defenses of uh, the, the client. We'll look at the um, cyber environment that that client is operating in from a, uh, a quantitative uh, perspective, i.e. do you have policies 
Uh, but we won't go into are the policies any good, i.e. a qualitative um, review. Uh, but we will be able to measure you against the STARA's own maturity standards. And then we'll also conduct a, um, a, uh, an insurance review. The insurance review isn't to advise on what insurance you need. It's just to identify where there is affirmative or non-affirmative or silent or buyback covers. So at least you know where the areas of gap exist. Uh, that product is available uh, for seven and a half thousand pounds for ship owners with fleets up to uh, 30, um, 30 ships. Uh, if you fall outside of that, we can uh, discuss specific pricing. Uh, we also have a second product, which is rather more um, thorough and is designed to bring ship owners, ports authorities, offshore contractors right up to the point where they can evidence going into an audit that they will be able to pass across the five elements that Bill um, uh, detailed uh, in the first presentation. Um, that is a longer um, assessment. It takes routinely between four and uh, six weeks, uh, requires a qualitative view of policies, procedures, um, disaster recovery plans, BCPs. Uh, again, it will result in a gap analysis. Where are you relative to the IMO guidelines? We would probably take it a little bit broader because actually we're also keen to make sure that security events like ransomware or intellectual property theft fall within the scope. So it is a little bit broader than just merely the IMO benchmarks. Uh, we're very keen to ensure that ship owners have the most positive outcome that they can have for, as a benefit from this review. Uh, typically, um, and again, typically depends on the size of the company, typically depends on the size of fleets. But if we were looking at a typical ship owner of around about 25 ships, we'd be looking for around about $30,000 to complete that um, review. That's a very comprehensive answer there. So thanks a lot for that, Rob. appreciate it. Um, Bill, on yes, what sir. basis have you determined that there will be many cyber attacks next year? Um, I don't think it's uh, beyond uh, probability to assume that there will be many cyber attacks next year. Um, and we take the view that actually a cyber attack on a vessel is inevitable. Um, and the question is about one of scale. So I think that the uh, uh, part of our part of the difficulty with assigning uh, likelihood um, estimates to cyber attack is that there is no actuarial data of any depth, unlike other lines of business. And I think that there is a, a mistake in terms of false levels of accuracy if you try and ascribe a likeliness to a, a cyber event from occurring or not, because you simply don't know. They come from anywhere. They come from at any time. And you know, if it's a zero day attack, it could be just unlucky because somebody's thought of it before the manufacturers have had a time, chance to close the gap. So I think we assume the prudent view is to assume something will happen and therefore the objective is to ensure that the risk is minimized and the losses are minimized. I think we're not in the game of prediction because um, every prediction that we will make will be wrong. So I think we focus on the fact that the event will happen the issue is what is the necessary steps to take to mitigate the downside risk. Thank you very much, Bill. I appreciate that. Unfortunately, for the pile of questions coming in now, we've run out of time and uh, going to have to call a halt to it. Um, I just want to sort of thank everybody on the panel. So Howard, Bill and Christopher for your presentations and uh, Rob for coming on to help with answering the questions. And obviously to our members and the wider audience who have tuned in to listen to these questions, listen to these presentations. Thank you very much for your time. I know everyone is busy, but um, at the West, obviously we feel that um, cyber risk is a huge issue and that it's coming in on the 1st of January needs to be in place. And I think it's a good time as a reminder to everybody that this is on its way. So with that, thank you to everyone and have a good day, morning, afternoon or evening. <laughs> thank you, Simon. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you.